Welcome everyone to this amazing assembly that we have lined up for you. My name's Ed, I'm the founder of Empathy Week and you may have seen me across this week. I am very, very excited that we have managed to get Tendi on Zoom today and he's, we're joined by him um, all the way from the pool. So Tendi, if you say hello. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, it's a great oh, to yeah. be here at Empathy Week. Thank you Ed for having me here. Absolutely, absolutely. And we know that there'll be children watching across the world at the, um, at the moment live. So welcome to everyone. Um, and you may have watched Tendi's story or you may be watching it in a couple of weeks time. But Tendi, uh, I'm, I'm going to let Tendi um, introduce himself a little bit. But he is an amazing, amazing man who has been working on the mountains from a very young age, um, even since he was a, a young child, really a teen, young teenager. And um, he has summited Everest 14 times, which is the highest mountain in the world. And we've also collected a lot of um, questions from different primary aged children, which we're going to ask Tendi now, and we're going to be able to listen to some of his answers. But Tendi, do you want to just expand a little bit on that before I ask some, ask you some of the questions that some students have asked? Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, so I'm so happy to be here sharing my stories uh, about mountaineering. And uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, tell everybody uh, uh, where I come from and, uh, and uh, what I do at the moment. So uh, I was born in the village uh, in the remote mountains, uh, which is located at uh, 2,500 meters of elevation. Uh, and uh, so uh, we have a very, um, only very few houses up there. And uh, it is surrounded by a, a dense forest because it, it is inside a national park. But a uh, good thing is that, <clears throat> you know, you get to see uh, different animals every day and uh, different birds and uh, different uh, trees and lots of uh, different kinds of flowers and all that. <clears throat> so, you know, for example, we don't have like any televisions or any fancy toys up in the my village. So, uh, but in instead of that, you know, we have got all that uh, uh, beautiful natural beauties uh, surrounded uh, by us. And uh, so, uh, yeah, this is where I was born. And uh, when I was born and when I grew up in this village, I grew up so simply, you know, without having a lot of uh, uh, things and lots of options in, in my life. As a very uh, young kid, I would just get out of home and uh, play on my farm, uh, play with rocks and uh, play with the rivers and water. And uh, we used to have uh, like uh, quite a lot of snow during the uh, winter time and uh, the winter last quite a, quite a long time. So all the mountains, uh, all the hills which are green in the summertime, they get all covered up with the snow in, in winter time. So they basically look like a very serious mountains. So I got a really uh, used to see those mountains and uh, you know, as the season changes or uh, the colors of the, uh, of the environment, the trees and hills, they all change as well. So um, it was a beautiful place to be actually, you know, uh, even though we didn't have like, you know, any televisions to watch cartoons, like, like my kids, they have a cartoons in Kathmandu these days on the televisions, whereas when I was little like them, my, my daughter is uh, almost 10 years old and uh, she has a lot of options, you know, she can go play in the pond park, she can play at her schools, they have a lot of uh, options, whereas when I was like her age, age of 10 years old, uh, I would just stay in, in the village. Uh, uh, playing, you know, with the with the with whatever it is there. Mainly, it's like just rocks and uh, and a piece of woods and that. You you've already you've just kind of described a bit of your story and a bit of the background, and obviously students will see um, more of that as well through through the films if they haven't watched them already. Um, we've got some questions here from different age groups. Um, I'm going to ask um, a few from uh, first Reed Street Primary um, students and. Um, yeah, this one from, from Jasmine, um, she asks, do you ever get scared when you are going up or down the mountain? Yes, I, I get a, quite a bit of scare, especially uh, when I was climbing the mountains for the first time, I was really scared. 
but then I got into a training. So I did a mountaineering training to feel more confident. And uh, with all the training uh, and the experiences that I gained over the past many years, uh, now I feel much more confident, but I still have to be very careful and, uh, and be in the safety and uh, climb is smart. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, another question from Charlie says, um, we think of you as kind of a superhero. Is this how you see yourself? Great question. No. Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just a normal climber. Uh, I love mountains a lot. And uh, I think in my life, the superhero is mountain, not me. Uh, mountain has been the best teachers in my life. And uh, so mountain has given me so much opportunities. And that's why I can't thank and appreciate enough to the mountains all the opportunity that I got from her. And uh, I have always a lot of respect and uh, I'm always learning a lot of things from the mountains every year. Even though a mountain doesn't speak, I feel like mountain speaks to me. So I carefully listen to her and uh, mountain has so much to tell me and I'm enjoying this. So mountain is definitely the superhero for me. I'm just a, just a normal climber. Amazing, that's amazing. I always love listening to how you talk about mountain. <clears throat> and um, Sonny has asked, have you ever had to return whilst you're on a mountain due to danger? Yes, um, I had to return a couple of times. Uh, so one time I had to return because one of my clients got uh, 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 eye problem because he had a, like, a, you know, before he came to climb Everest, he had done a eye surgery. So he had to turn around from very near to the summit of Everest. So it was like a 30 minutes climb to get to the top. And from that point, I had to turn back to save my clients, you know, because he, he, he was having an issue with his eye. He couldn't see anything. So we had to turn back from that point. And this was first time. And second time that I had to turn back was uh, I was uh, guiding my client. And we got at 8,000 meter and above 8,000 meter, it is called death zone. So any mistake you make with a very small mistake you make, you can die anytime, any, anywhere. So um, it is very, very dangerous to, to climb mountains when it's very dangerous. So uh, the main reason that I had to turn back um, from 8,000 meter was because uh, wind was very strong. So it was like more than 65 kilometers uh, wind per hour. So that is considered very dangerous in, in an 8,000 meter. So that's why to protect my clients and to protect myself and my team, uh, I turned back from 8,000 meter, which is our last camp to the base camp. And, uh, and we are all safe. Mm, yeah, it's very, very, <clears throat> very high up. And it's hard to breathe as well. And another question is, how, how cold does it get at the top of Mount Everest? How, how cold does it get? So it depends uh, on the uh, on what time you reach there. Uh, like if you reach there very early in the morning, or that means to say uh, before sunrise, then the temperature could be very cold. Uh, like um, I, I would get like minus uh, almost like minus thirty, minus thirty five. And uh, but um, if if the sun sun rises there, then temperature dramatically changes uh, quickly. So the temperature temperature can uh, get to like uh, minus ten or so, no more than that. But again, uh, it it you know um, with the changing of a wind, the 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 weather, the time, uh, all this change the 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 temperature um, uh, on a mountain. So, but then when there is no wind at all and it's sunny, sometimes you may even get really warm with a very uh, thin jackets. Uh, I mostly, when I reach the summit of Everest, I mostly reach there with the sunrise. So uh, basically I, I can take off my gloves for a while to take a picture. And, uh, and at that time, I kind of read how much cold it is there. And in fact, you can bear a, a little bit of cold is bearable. Yeah, and, and I'm, we're going to see a quick clip of um, you at the top this year. Um, now but um another question was what sort of equipment do you need um to climb everest can you, can you just go up in your shoes or do you have specialist equipment uh well for climbing uh, uh everest and also like other eight thousand meter mountains 
uh, you need to have um, uh, special uh, climbing equipments designed for very harsh weather, uh, designed for very big mountains, uh, something that is very light, but very, very warm. So mostly what I wear is like, uh, I, I put a, a lot of, uh, in a few tin layers, woolen, uh, woolen product, uh, they, are, they must be long sleep and maybe with a, with a hood as well. And then uh, I add uh, on, a, on top of uh, like a base layer and then the soft shell. Then I put on like um, a puffy down suit that comes in one piece from like a head to toe. So that down suit is a, it's a pretty uh, warm uh, jacket, uh, which is like uh, uh, designed for 8,000 meter mountains. And it's, it's sometimes it's super uh, warm. When it's not uh, windy, it's very, very warm. So um, yeah, I wear that. And then uh, second thing, most important thing is uh, it's, a, it's a very heavy proper shoes. It's a climbing shoes. And there are many different kinds of shoes that you can find in the market. But uh, the one that we wear for 8,000 meter one is um, uh, called 8,000 meter triple boot. So they are, they are very well insulated uh, boot. Um, and uh, they are, nowadays they are also found in a very light weight. Whereas before, when I just began climbing Everest, it was a very heavy one. But nowadays, uh, you know, they, they might weigh like uh, two, ki two kilos uh, each side. So it's not that bad. Um, and, uh, and that's very important. And on top of that, we have the like normal climbing equipments like crampons, that goes under the boot. And then we, we use a harness, like climbing harness, uh, which is almost a similar that you use for like rock climbing and indoor climbing. But we may just have a different uh, set of equipments like uh, Jumer, which is uh, ascender, and then uh, uh, descender, which we call it descender. So there are many different kinds of uh, descenders as well. And then we have got like uh, several carabiners with the safety lines and and so on and then we should have like a very big uh, puffy uh, down gloves and uh, some people they may feel very cold even after they have like a big gloves and jackets so uh, for those people they can also bring like a, a, a hand warmer so nowadays you can find the hand warmers and that hand warmer uh, could help you you know get uh, much uh, warmer and um and then you obviously need to have a nice uh, 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 woolen hat to cover your head. Of course, you can have like a hoodie uh, to cover your head, but I always use like something really thin and a very warm woolen hat to protect my head because uh, this is very, very important. On the mountains, um, you know, one of the most sensitive part is your eye, your nose, your cheek, your air, of course, your fingers and toes. So we need to be fully aware of uh, all the safety for your, you know, this part of your body. And uh, so that's why we make sure that we uh, uh, select the right uh, equipments, right gears, and then uh, uh, we wear them correctly. And uh, we always must have like a extra backup in your pack just in case, you know, one get lost or, or uh, you know, get wet or something like that. So we take care of ourselves a lot and it's very, very important. And sometimes you may start feeling cold on your fingers and toes. Uh, we move them very frequently, uh, you know, keep frisking so, so that it doesn't get uh, cold. Sometimes people are lazy and they don't want to move their fingers and toes. And uh, after, you know, they start to get cold and if they don't move it, then after, for, uh, after like one hour or two, it is too late. So that means to say that they can, they can lose all their fingers and toes. So that's where, you know, they need to be very smart. They need to be very active, uh, you know, uh, and, and communicating with your body all the time. Wow. Yeah. And that's, they call that frostbite, don't they? When, when you um, lose your fingers. Yeah, in the cold. exactly. So you want to avoid that. It sounds like you have so much, so much equipment. One of the things you talk about in the film, and, and I know from knowing you as well, is that you talk about also, um, working together on a team and you talk about compassion and and the great things and what the, the mountain teaches you can you um explain a bit more what you mean about you know how you've learned compassion on the mountain with the people that you've worked with first of all uh mountain itself it's a, a very sacred it's a holy mountains and we sherpa believe the mountains 
uh, as a as a uh, you know place of you know you know the god or goddess. So we always believe that uh, as you pray to the mountains, as you believe the mountains are like a god and goddess, you need to also stay and uh, treat mountains like as if they are really a living goddess. So um, you want to be very uh, disciplined in front of uh, them. And uh, actually, um, I don't, you know, I don't know how much it's true that that these mountains are like god or goddess. But for me, I always have a big respect, you know, just by looking at the at the image of the mountains, because a mountain for me is a definitely a, a symbol of uh, peace. Uh, as you look at the mountains, you kind of forget everything. You know, the stress, you forget all the hard work that, that you have done, all the bad experience, bad thing, whatever it is. Uh, when you are looking at the mountains, you feel like just wow, you know, it's, it's big mountains and there are so many details to enjoy on the mountains. And um, so immediately, uh, yeah, you kind of feel relaxed when you see the mountains. You don't feel like panic, you don't feel like that. And of course, when you're climbing on it, um, you know, you have to be very careful. So, um, you know, mountain is beautiful, but also it can be very, very dangerous. So we need to be very um, careful about our safety and uh, about choosing the right path and uh, about choosing the right campsite for sleeping overnight so that, uh, you know, you are not exposed to like avalanches or things like that. Mountain has so many things that can give you, uh, but you just have to take care of that uh, uh, carefully. You know, you, you have to choose the uh, right thing. So, um, and like in the, on the mountain, uh, since, uh, you know, we regard the mountain as a, as a goddess uh, and as a symbol of peace, I think we all climbers should uh, uh, think uh, that, uh, you know, it's a symbol of really peace. Uh, it means that I should practice peace as well through my heart. Mm. Uh, Sometimes, <clears throat> you know, people do a competitions, like unhealthy competitions. People want to win. They say, oh, I want to do these competitions. I want to do that. You know, they all come with a different kind of um, philosophy. But for me, it's uh, once you're in the mountain, just enjoy it. Just be there, relax and uh, think positive, you know, like a mountain. So um, breathe well, long breathe, and, uh, and look around you, like have a 360 degree view every maybe a couple hours. And uh, as you climb and, and, and when you have to stop for a rest or drink, I just take a time to look around, the, around me. And that is a great gift. And if we don't take that gift, um, you know, it might not come back again. So um, uh, that's why yeah. I always tell my climbers, uh, my clients to hey, enjoy this, enjoy this moment because this is truly amazing. You know, well, this is cool. something that we don't do every day in our life. When we're having a, a breakfast inside a tent, freezing cold, uh, hopping and puffing, you know, and it's still that, that moment are very beautiful because that's something what we don't do every day, every day in our life. We have so much in our life. We, we so much comfort and uh, so, much, so much things in our life. We're kind of racing. And for me, mountains allows or gives us a chance to be um, like neutral, you know, like to, to slow down and enjoy the life more and, uh, and, and realize how important and how precious this life is just by looking at those mountains. And, uh, and staying silent for a little bit makes you feel like, wow, this is real. And this is, this is the real life. And yeah. that's why for every climbers, uh, you know, I suggest uh, to practice this and I suggest them to fully enjoy, but with a very uh, uh, good happiness and also very kind heart towards other people. You know, so uh, be compassionate to yourself. You know, that means to say, like, enjoy all this moment so that when you feel very good, that means, uh, you know, you're, you're giving time for yourself. And that is also the most important part of the compassion. And when you are very satisfied, when you're in a good hand, uh, then you are also obviously thinking good thing for other people. And not only, you know, 
for the people, but also it's very important to respect the mountains. Uh, so respecting mountain is also part of the compassion, you know, saying like to appreciate the mountains for that opportunity. And um, linking to what you've just said, you know, about being on the mountain and enjoying it and being restful, we've got some, we're, we're running out of time. So we're going to have some quick, quick fire questions, Tendi, if that's okay. Um, so you can you can answer some of these ones. And, and some of these questions are also from another school, Bishop Gilpin. Um, and the first one's from quite a young student um, who's asked, do you have a picnic at the top of the mountain when you get there? <laughs> uh, uh, not really. Uh, you know, you really don't think about having picnic because you're so busy about enjoying the view of the top of the world. Mm. Uh, and you, you really want to spend... Uh, you know, as less as possible because you, uh, you know, you you don't have much oxygen up there. So the views is amazing, and you really want to take opportunity to enjoy that view, and uh, and try to get down as soon as possible. But yeah. on the way down, on the way down, we grab some food. But the food, uh, you know, we're we're not relaxed there. We are always attached to the rope, and we usually bring like some candy or like some uh, some chocolate we put inside our jacket. And as, as we're coming down, as soon as we get a little opportunity, we just take that chocolate out and uh, open it and we, we put it in our mouth. Mm. And uh, as we're eating, we're also coming down on the, on the fixed roll. Yeah, so, so not, not enough time to get the picnic blanket out, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, and, and in terms of um, the record, someone's a really great question. What is the record you're most proud of in your climbing life? What achievement? So, um, well, I mean, uh, I have uh, I have been climbing Everest now for 20 years. And then uh, uh, for me, the greatest achievement is to be uh, able to uh, guide my clients uh, to the top and uh, to show them how the world looks like from the top of the world and to bring back them home uh, safely. That has been my greatest uh, achievement so far. Amazing, amazing. I want to also say though, apart, you're probably one of your second greatest achievements would, would be about summiting Everest twice in one week. Um, and I think you've got other <clears> records <throat> as well. But yeah, absolutely. I think you've always said safety and um, you know, life yeah. is the most important thing. Um, absolutely. Yeah. What um this is a really great question as well. What are your typical emotions when you climb? What typical emotions do you have? uh well i mean um i definitely feel a little bit nervous when i leave home uh, for climbing mountains you know because i'm gone there for almost uh, two and a half months uh that means i will not be uh, able to see my family for that that long and um, mountain actually it's beautiful but also it's a very hard hard work it's a uh, it's a very uh difficult job for the sherpas uh but then, um, you know, we fully depend on um, ourselves to be very careful. We rely on the mountains, God, and the blessings of mountains and blessings of our family. And then, uh, so with that, uh, you know, motivation, we climb the mountains. And, uh, but sometimes, you know, we, we see our friends, uh, who could not come back home because uh, of, you know, they die from avalanches or falling into crevices and things like that. So anything can happen, but, um, you know, we climb, we climb with a very positive spirit, positive uh, vibe. And, uh, and, and we always think, you know, about the, the kindness, about the compassion. And we, th we think that if we do that, if we practice that compassion on a mountain, then mountain will definitely be also very kind to us and uh, we will be always protected. Amazing. And um, Tendi, the last question before, before we have to say goodbye to you is um, who is your climbing idol um, and, and who got you in, into climbing? Maybe the first part is, is better. Who is, your, who is your kind of climbing hero? Well, definitely uh, those climbers, especially um, uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and uh, Tenzing Sherpa. These two are uh, uh, great heroes for me uh, because they, they were the first person to reach the summit of Everest in 1953. 
And uh, after the successfully submitted, you know, um, the, the climbing Everest has begun from that, uh, that age or that year. Uh, that they haven't just climbed to the top of the world, but also they have introduced the world uh, of uh, climbing uh, Westerners and Sherpa together. So that has uh, set up a kind of a culture in our climbing uh, uh, practice in the Himalayas. That's why um, as a young uh, generation Sherpa, I have a huge respect to that relationship that they have begun. And today we're carrying that uh, friendship, we're uh, uh, carrying that culture and, you know, respecting their uh, uh, and appreciating their, you know, uh, uh, their friendship on the summit of Everest. And it's been always a great uh, experience, uh, you know, sharing, climbing at the top of the world with the, with the friends from uh, uh, all around the world. Amazing. Tandy, that is the perfect way to end talking about two different cultures and two groups of people coming together and then trying to achieve something great. It's what Empathy Week's all about, trying to understand other people and then get along and work together in, in life. So thank you again so much for um, being here today, being here with, with the students that are watching live. And um, I'm sure you will have some messages. If, if you know you are a school and you want to send a message, you can use our contact form to send a message to to Tendi directly. Let us know what you thought of Tendi's film, what you thought of today. Um, and Tendi, just one last thing for any teachers in particular, you do have a book out at the moment. Do you want to just quickly say a little thing about the book? Yes, uh, Ed, I have um, just launched a book, uh, which is a story about me and about my father, because my father was also a climber. And uh, also he uh, migrated from a different uh, place in the mountain to the place where I was born. So this book uh, tells a story of about two generations of Sherpas, almost three generations. So it's quite interesting book, uh, you know, uh, telling the, the the different life stories. So for many people, you can find uh, uh, quite uh, amazing because, uh, you know, it's totally different stories. Uh, but uh, for us, it's like, uh, you know, I have tried to explain what our life was all about, you know, it's all in the book. And uh, so, yeah, the name of the book is um, uh, uh, Higher Than Everest. So it means to say, uh, it's, you know, and the, the, my ambition is actually much higher than Everest. And uh, so I'm doing a lot of projects in my village and I'm also supporting the educations in my village. And uh, the main aim of book is, uh, you know, not just to tell uh, my stories, but also people, those who buy the books, uh, all the proceeds that comes from the book, I put, uh, I donate to a, a charity called Tendi Sherpa Foundation. And through that uh, funds, I support for the educations in the remote villages of Nepal so that children doesn't have to become a porter at the very young age and they can achieve their dream to, uh, to be educated and uh, and uh, yeah that's why i'm really supporting for that and i'm really looking forward and i hope uh, those who will get this uh, copy of book hope they will enjoy it and uh, if you have any comments or feedback then feel free to let me know but also at the same time ed i want to say thank you so much i really enjoyed um, sharing these stories i wish i have more time we have more time mm -hmm. to tell all these stories but hey uh, we have got a uh, you know lots of stories uh, included in the book hopefully you can get that and i i really want to say all the best to all the students uh, i really enjoy this and uh, i wish you all the best for your future and i hope to see you climbing uh, you know uh, the mountains and uh, reaching your own sum summit of everest Amazing. Sandy, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone that's watched and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you.